from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I want to thank, first of all, uh, Mark Demunation, uh, the chief of the uh, Rare Books and Special Collections Division, who not only helped make this uh, event possible, but just let me know that you couldn't hear in the back. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, also, Rosemary Placas uh, from the same division, who has uh, put the uh, events uh, that we've uh, done with the Rare Book and Special Collection for this literary birthday series together. So thank you, Rosemary, for this. Um, First of all, uh, I'll ask you to turn off your cell phones. Um, you know how that all goes. Um, I'll give you a second. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We're turning 75 next year. We are the home of the nation's poet laureate. Uh, our current poet laureate is Phil Levine. Uh, we do all sorts of readings and events. Uh, like this and like our poet laureate's inaugural reading and closing reading of the season. Uh, you can uh, get a little information about the uh, Poetry and Literature Center uh, right in the back and you can sign up our, our sign up sheet to uh, find out more about uh, events like this. We have a number of uh, birthday celebrations uh, next year with um, Gwendolyn Brooks, Ralph Ellison, Langston Hughes, and Walt Whitman. So, and all on the actual day um, which I'm, I'm very proud of. Luckily, you know, these are the right these are the writers who had birthdays that weren't on Saturday or Sunday. Um, so the, the event uh, this afternoon will go as follows: We have uh, two featured readers, uh, Joanne Beard and Maud Casey, and uh, they'll they'll uh, read selections from Alcott's writing and specifically focus on uh, her landmark novel, Little Women and talk a little bit about the importance of um, uh, Alcott's work uh, to, the, to their own work and read a little bit of their own work. Uh, both our uh, featured writers will tell you a little bit more about Louisa May Alcott, who would have been uh, 197 years old today. And I'm sure a lot of you, right? 197? Is it 179? Oh, 179. No, I mixed the numbers up when I wrote it down. I did. I did add it up on my on my little phone. Well, she would have been 179 years old today. No, I knew. I knew for this event too. I thought when I was making this paragraph about a little bio of of Louisa Malcott, I thought, oh man, I know people in the audience are going to know more than I know about her. And so feel free to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about her. For those of you who don't know uh, the story of one of America's most important authors, uh, she was born in Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1832, and she published five books under her own name and as Anne Barnard before writing Little Women, the first of the March family saga. Her more than 30 books also include Little Men, Joe's Boys, An Old Fashioned Girl, and Hospital Sketches, written of her time as a nurse in Georgetown's Union Hotel Hospital during the Civil War. And I think we have, we have hospital sketches. We have Little Women. Um, <coughs> what? They, yeah, they're, they're up here, along with uh, my favorite, my favorite uh, uh, Louisa May Alcott title, Modern Mephistopheles. Um, Later, she became an advocate for women's suffrage and was the first woman to register to vote in Concord, Massachusetts, uh, where she spent time with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau as a child. And you'll hear more about that um, uh, a little bit later with our speakers. Um, she is, though, best known for her contribution to American letters. As the New York Times stated in her obituary in March 1888, quote, there was probably no writer among women better loved by the young than she. End quote. Uh, let me tell you a little bit now about our two readers who we are thrilled to have here today. Uh, Joanne Beard is the author of two books, Boys of My Youth, a collection of autobiographical essays, and the novel In Zanesville, which uh, features a character named Joe. Uh, a 1997 Whiting Award winner and 2003 Guggenheim Foundation Fellow, she currently teaches at Sarah Lawrence College and lives both in Manhattan and in upstate New York. 
Our second reader, Maude Casey, lives a bit closer in Cleveland Park and teaches at the University of Maryland as well as Warren Wilson College. She's the author of two novels, The Shape of Things to Come and Genealogy, and the story collection, Drastic. Uh, Casey is the recipient of the 2008 Calvino Prize and a 2008-2009 DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities Fellowship. I should say, too, that we do have copies of um, Little Women as well as books, uh, 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 Genealogy and In Zanesville for sale. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can get your copies, and buy your copies and get them signed afterwards. Um, so our two writers will read and then uh, Amanda Zimmerman of the Rare Books and Special Collections Division at the library uh, will come up to talk about this tabletop display uh, featuring Alcott's works and about the invaluable work the division does to ensure that the works of writers like Louisa May Alcott are preserved for future generations. So please welcome our two writers. Thank you, Rob. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Okay. Hi there. Thanks to everybody for coming out today, and thank you, Rob, for including me in this event. Um, I need to... As soon as I see rare books, I want to take a drink of water with a trembling hand, so... <laughs> Um, okay. I discovered Little Women in a box that came from a church rummage sale, nestled between comic books and cliff notes and whatever else. Jackpot. There she was. A girl named Jo, just like I was a girl named Jo. She was a Josephine. I was named after a Josephine. Her personality overflowed and she didn't care one bit. They told her to contain it and she told them she couldn't. You can't know how much I needed her at the time I found her. So it's a great pleasure for me to come here today and stand before you on behalf of the feminist and humanitarian and literary light Louisa May Alcott, an integral part not just of our American Bloomsbury, but I venture to say of every girl in this room's upbringing. And by girl I mean women, and by women I also mean the men who are here. We'll, we'll include you, too. I'm going to read a passage from the third chapter of Little Women in which Jo and her older sister Meg are invited to a party given by their wealthier neighbor. They have to figure out how to make themselves presentable without the proper clothes or, in Jo's case, the proper manners. Chapter 3 is called The Lawrence Boy. Jo, Jo, where are you, cried Meg at the foot of the garret stairs. Here, answered a husky voice from above, and running up, Meg found her sister eating apples and crying over the air of Redcliffe, wrapped up in a comforter on an old three-legged sofa by the sunny window. This was Joe's favorite refuge, and here she loved to retire with half a dozen russets and a nice book, to enjoy the quiet and the society of a pet rat who lived nearby and didn't mind her a particle. Such fun, only see. A regular note of invitation from Mrs. Gardner for tomorrow night, cried Meg. Marmy is willing we should go. Now what shall we wear? What's the use of asking that when you know we shall wear our poplins because we haven't got anything else, answered Jo with her mouth full. If I only had a silk, sighed Meg. Mother says I may when I'm 18, perhaps, but two years is an everlasting time to wait. I'm sure our pops look like silk, and they're nice enough for us. Yours is as good as new, but I forgot the burn and the tear in mine. Whatever shall I do? The burn shows horridly, and I can't take any out. You must sit still all you can, and keep your back out of sight. The front is all right. I shall have a new ribbon for my hair, and Marmy will lend me her little pearl pin, and my new slippers are lovely, and my gloves will do, though they aren't as nice as I'd like. Mine are spoilt with lemonade, and I can't get any new ones, so I sh shall have to go without, said Jo, who never troubled herself much about dress. You must have gloves, or I won't go, cried Meg decidedly. Then I'll stay still. I don't care much for company dancing. It's no fun to go sailing around. I like to fly about and cut capers. 
You can't ask mother for new gloves. She said when you spoiled the others that she shouldn't get you any more this winter. Can't you fix them anyway? asked Meg. I could hold them crunched up in my hand so no one will know how stained they are. That's all I can do. No, I'll tell you how we can manage. Each wear one good one and carry a bad one, don't you see? Your hands are bigger than mine and you'll stretch my glove dreadfully. Then I'll go without. I don't care what people say, cried Joe, taking up her book. You may have it, you may. Only don't stain it and do behave nicely. Don't put your hands behind you or stare or say Christopher Columbus, will you? <laughs> don't worry about me. I'll be prim as a dish and not get into any scrapes if I can help it. Now go and answer your note and let me finish this splendid story. On New Year's Eve, the two younger girls played dressing maids, and the two elder were absorbed in the all-important business of getting ready for the party. Meg wanted a few curls about her face, and Joe undertook to pinch the papered locks with a pair of hot tongs. Ought they to smoke like that? asked Beth from her perch on the bed. It's the dampness drying, replied Joe. What a queer smell. It's like burnt feathers, observed Amy. <laughs> There now, I'll take off the papers and you'll see a cloud of little ringlets, said Joe. She did take off the papers, but no cloud of ringlets appeared, for the hair came with the papers, and the horrified hairdresser laid a row of little scorched bundles on the bureau before her victim. Oh, 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 what have you done? I'm spoiled. I can't go. My hair, oh, my hair, wailed Meg. Just my luck. You shouldn't have asked me to do it. I always <laughs> spoil everything. I'm no end sorry, but the tongs were too hot, and so I've made a mess, groaned poor Joe, regarding the black pancakes with tears of regret. It isn't spoiled. Just frizzle it and tie your ribbon so the ends come on your forehead a bit, and it will look like the latest fashion. I've seen lots of girls do it, said Amy. Serves me right for trying to be fine. I wish I'd let my hair alone, cried Meg. So do I. It was so smooth and pretty. But it will soon grow out again, said Beth, coming to kiss and comfort the shorn sheep. After various lesser mishaps, Meg was finished at last. And by the united exertions of the family, Joe's hair was got up and her dress on. They looked very well in their simple suits, Meg in silvery drab with a blue velvet snood, lace frills and the pearl pin, Joe in maroon with a stiff gentlemanly linen collar and a white chrysanthemum or two for her only ornament. Each put on one nice light glove and carried one soiled one and all pronounced the effect quite easy and nice. Meg's high heel slippers were dreadfully tight and hurt her though she would not own it and Joe's 19 hairpins all seemed stuck straight into her head which was not exactly comfortable, but dear me, let us be elegant or die. <laughs> you. So that last was authorial comment. Dear me, let us be elegant or die. From time to time through the book, I discovered when I read it again, Louisa May, like Joe March, blurts out her own opinion on what's happening to the girls. That quality of breaking the proscenium to speak directly to the reader created, at least in me, a feeling of intimacy between the author and her characters and the author and her readers. We're all in it together, wrecking the hair and clutching the spoiled glove and feeling stirred by the dreamy boy next door named, in a twist that rivals a girl named Jo, Lori. I, a shy, middle child, Midwestern girl, thrilled to the idea that Joe was a blurter, a barger, a person with a fried skirt who didn't care, a girl who longed to cut capers, whatever those were, and who wrote her own newspaper and expected people to read it. Actually, she demanded that people read it. She delivered it to them in their post office box. Louisa May Alcott created not just one of the most memorable and realistic characters for 19th and 20th and maybe 21st century girls to model themselves after, but she did something I think is even more immense. She depicted character being shaped. 
not characters as in Joe, Meg, Beth, and Amy, but character as in morality, as in the striving to be a decent and whole human being, to live within a society but also within a moral code. Her pilgrims make their progress through life and through the pages of this long book by understanding certain things, that they have flaws, that all human beings have flaws, that recognizing those defects or weaknesses of personality or character is paramount to overcoming them. Their mother and father take parenting seriously. They actively work to shape their girls, reminding them over and over that making mistakes is human and also useful, that forgiveness is an achievement, one that is absolutely necessary when living in close quarters, both physically and psychologically, because this was an era, for the most part, when girls got up in the morning and they spent all day in the same small space where little hurts could not be allowed to fester for the good of everyone involved. So this family, for nearly 500 pages, works to get along, to highlight and cherish each other's differences, maybe their flaws, to alternately revel in them and rein them in. So I'm going to read another brief example of this. This is in the opening of the book on, on, uh, in the first chapter. Joe does use such slang words, observed Amy with a reproving look at the long figure stretched on the rug. Joe immediately sat up, put her hands in her apron pockets, and began to whistle. Don't, Joe, it's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude, unladylike girls. I hate affected nimini-pimini chits. <laughs> Birds in their little nests agree, sang Beth the peacemaker, with such a funny face that both sharp voices softened to a laugh, and the pecking ended for that time. Really, girls, you are both to be blamed, said Meg, beginning to lecture in her elder sister fashion. You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and behave better, Josephine. It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl, but now you are so tall and turn up your hair, you should remember that you're a young lady. I ain't, and if turning up my hair makes me one, I'll wear it in two tails till I'm 20, cried Jo, pulling off her net and shaking down her chestnut mane. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss March and wear long gowns, and look as prim as a china aster. It's bad enough to be a girl anyway when I like boys' games and work and manners. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy, and it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with Papa, and I can only stay at home and knit like a pokey old woman. And Joe shook the blue army sock till the needles rattled like castanets, and her ball bounded across the room. Poor Joe, it's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls, said Beth, smoothing the rough head at her knee with a hand that all the dishwashing and dusting in the world could not make ungentle in its touch. As for you, Amy, con continued Meg, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant, but your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. If Joe is a tomboy and Amy is a goose, what am I, please, asked Beth, ready to share the lecture. You're a dear and nothing else, answered Meg warmly. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and I know, yes, Louisa's brand of nervousness might be out of fashion right now, but more's the pity for that. The March girls, chapter by chapter, hold themselves to such a high standard of behavior, it feels almost subversive now. The fact that they don't always achieve their goals, well, therein lies the reason that we couldn't put the book down then and now. And the power of suggestion is great, especially when a book has lodged itself into one's consciousness at a ripe and impressionable age. 
I somehow discovered in this process, in the process of being asked to reread this masterpiece and to come here and talk about it, that I, in some small way, recreated the scene that I read to you first in my own book in Zanesville. I didn't know it at the time I wrote it or even later. I didn't recognize it until I picked this book up 40 years after I read it the first time. So in this scene, my narrator, named Joe, has been invited to a party given by a wealthier neighbor, and she figure, has to figure out how to get ready and feel comfortable in this society that she really you know, can't um, bring herself to join. So this is a brief scene from In Zanesville. I spend the next afternoon mentally preparing for the party by hiding out behind the green velvet chair in the corner of the living room. When I was younger and shorter, I made a reading nest for myself by stuffing a couch pillow back here and an old afghan, and then crawling in with my book, staying all day if they let me, creeping out only to get provisions. Now I have to fold myself in sideways with the register jabbing into me and my feet sticking out. Tammy the dog waits until I've got it all arranged and am still before gingerly climbing in and over to settle behind my knees. I still like it back here, the familiar scuffs and scribbles above the baseboard, the bright, unfaded back of the green chair, the headless carpet tack you have to watch out for. This is where the pivotal events of my childhood unfolded. While I ate banana and root beer popsicles, two by two, tucking the sticks neatly under the skirt of the chair. It's where Sunnybank Lad met Lady. Ken met his friend Flicka. Atlanta burned. Manderley burned. Lassie came home. Jim ran away. Alice got small. Wilbur got big. David Copperfield was born. Beth died. And on an endless, gloomy winter afternoon, Jody shot his yearling. The pretty little deer named Flag, staggering and bloodied, doomed from his romp through the tender shoots of corn and the mother's bad aim, pursued by the desperate, crazed boy who had to put him out of his suffering, all the fault of mothers and corn. My own mother had had to come in and pull the chair out in order to see what was going on that day. She was sympathetic until she saw the popsicle sticks. <laughs> That's a bit ridiculous, isn't it, she says now, passing by on her way somewhere and seeing me crammed into my old space. What's ridiculous is that there's nowhere in this house to do homework, I reply. What do you call that big table in the dining room? What do you call the crap all over it that I'm sick of cleaning up? She peers over the top of the chair at me. I open the tempest and stare into it. Listen, if this is how you talk to your family, you'll stay home tonight. How I talk? You just call me ridiculous, I say to my book. I did not, she answers, look at me. I look up at her, she has rollers in her hair. I did not, I said it might be a bit ridiculous to be jammed in there like that when there are plenty of other places you could read in this house. That's not what I heard. I actually don't care what you heard and I'm not gonna stand here arguing with the teenager about what I did or didn't say. And with that, she wanders away because she knows she's in the wrong. <laughs> I'm sick of being a teenager. Being a teenager so far hasn't gotten me anything beyond period cramps and nameless yearning, which I had as a kid, too. But this is a new kind of nameless yearning that has boys attached to it. And one thing is for sure. There are boys close behind wherever the popular girls are, like wolves following the campfires. What if they show up at the party tonight? What will I do then? What if there are popular boys there, ones who aren't used to being around uncute girls? I think about getting up to call Felicia to see how nervous she is, but the register is pouring out heat and the dog and I have melted together. Thank you.
What a pleasure and an honor um, to be here to, to celebrate Louisa May Alcott's birthday. Um, it's really just delicious, so thank you. November is the most disagreeable month in the whole year, said <laughs> Margaret, standing at the window one dull afternoon, looking out at the frostbitten garden. That's the reason I was born in it, observed Jo pensively, quite unconscious of the blot on her nose. This is, of course, our beloved Jo from Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. And I'm so glad that Joanne spoke to Jo's uh, kind of radicalness and Louisa May Alcott's radicalness. Um, because as I was thinking about Jo and thinking about Louisa May Alcott, I realized that kind of claiming Jo as your favorite little woman was a little bit akin to claiming John Lennon as your favorite Beatle. You know, sort of the obvious cool choice. But there are legions of us girl writers all grown up who found solace and inspiration in this rock star, in the rock star who created her. So back to that disagreeable month and that pensive girl. When my parents first read Little Women aloud to me, that word disagreeable registered as naughty, and the ink blot on Joe's nose was funny, a relief to a kid who probably had one on her nose, too. But after reading and rereading Little Women over the years, that word pensively has slowly come to the fore. Joe observed pensively her relationship to that disagreeable month. There's much more to it than naughtiness, and while the ink blot on her nose is still funny, it also links Joe's writing to that disagreeableness, which has to do with her quick temper, but also to do with discontentedness, restlessness, and longing. Emotions that spill out and over, like Joe's quick temper, but which are also part of something deeper, her artistic temperament. That disagreeableness fueled the writing of Joe, Alcott's fictitious alter ego, as they fueled Alcott's own writing life. About Alcott, her father, Bronson Alcott, who, as we know, shares her birthday today, wrote, she was a girl fit for the scuffle of things, filled with ferocity, ungovernable energy, passionate obstinacy. In her journal at the age of 14, Louisa wrote of herself, I am old for my age and don't much care for girls' things. People think I'm wild or queer, to which I say, my kind of girl and my kind of writer. My parents, who were writers, are writers, so the idea of writing as a profession was not odd to me as a child, but it was still mysterious. Who were these people hanging around in their bathrobes all day, locking themselves away in rooms, demanding silence? With Joe, Alcott offered me, to paraphrase Forster, the secret life of a girl writer. This, this secret life included wildness and queerness. It included frustration at her circumstance as a girl in a transcendentalist man's world. This feeling of frustration was something Alcott knew well. She rode tirelessly upstream against convention. It's very moving to me that Alcott sends the fictional patriarch, Mr. March, off to the Civil War when it was Alcott herself who got on a train to come serve as a nurse in Washington. No small thing, especially given that she contracted typhoid fever and was treated with mercury that effectively poisoned her and caused her ill health for the rest of her life. Although it's interesting that it was after she was treated that she began really writing. Um, so it's sort of part of her, part of that ferocity. Also, that it was a writing and in large part Little Women that paid off the Alcott family's substantial debts is impressive and, and also the sign of someone with that ferocity, ungovernable energy, passionate obstinacy. So the passages I've chosen um, from Little Women are to do with, with Jo and her Alcott-esque fierceness, that disagree disagreeableness, which includes messy, uncontained emotions, as well as the ability to shape them into something artful. So this first excerpt is from an earlier chapter, and it's the chapter in which Jo has become enraged with Amy and because Amy has burnt her, her book um, that she's been, been writing in. Um, and she's, due to her negligence, Amy has fallen through the ice. And so this is Joe with Marmee. Are you sure she is safe, whispered Joe, looking remorsefully at the golden head, which might have been swept away from her sight forever under the treacherous ice. Quite safe, dear. She is not hurt and won't even take cold, I think. You were so sensible in covering and getting her home quickly, replied her mother cheerfully. Lori did it all. I only let her go. Mother, if she should die, it would be my fault. 
and Joe dropped down beside the bed in a passion of penitent tears, telling all that had happened, bitterly condemning her hardness of heart and sobbing at her gratitude for being spared the heavy punishment which might have come upon her. It's my dreadful temper. I try to cure it. I think I have, and then it breaks out worse than ever. Oh, mother, what shall I do? What shall I do? cried poor Joe in despair. Watch and pray, dear. Never get tired of trying, and never think it is impossible to conquer your fault, said Mrs. March, drawing the blousy head to her shoulder and kissing the wet cheek so tenderly that Joe cried harder than ever. You don't know, you can't guess how bad it is. It seems as if I could do anything when I'm in a passion. I get so savage. I could hurt anyone and enjoy it. I'm afraid I shall do something dreadful someday and spoil my life and make everybody hate me. Oh, mother, help me. Do help me. I will, my child, I will. Don't cry so bitterly, but remember this day and resolve with all your soul that you will never know another like it. Joe, dear, we all have our temptations, some far greater than yours, and it often takes us all our lives to conquer them. You think your temper is the worst in the world, but mine used to be just like it. Yours, mother? Why, you are never angry. And for the moment, Joe forgot remorse and surprise. I've been trying to cure it for 40 years and have only succeeded in controlling it. I am angry nearly every day of my life, Joe, but I've learned not to show it, and I still hope to learn not to feel it, though it may take me another 40 years to do so. The patience and the humility of the face she loved so well was a better lesson to Joe than the wisest lecture, the sharpest reproof. She felt comforted at once by the sympathy and confidence given her, the knowledge that her mother had a fault like hers and tried to mend it, made her own easier to bear and strengthened her resolution to cure it, though 40 years seemed rather a long time to watch and pray to a girl of 15. <laughs> Marmy, angry, so angry. Okay, so this next one is from a much later chapter called Literary Lessons, and at this point, Joe has started to write. Uh, and it's, it's just a little bit about um, a description of her writing. And, and Louisa May Alcott described her own writing as falling into a vortex, and, and so you'll see that here as well. Fortune suddenly smiled upon Joe and dropped a good luck penny in her path. Not a golden penny exactly, but I doubt if half a million would have given more real happiness than, than did the little sum that came to her in this wise. Every few weeks, she would shut herself up in her room, put on her scribbling suit, and fall into a vortex, as she expressed it, writing away at her novel with all her heart and soul, for till that was finished, she could find no peace. Her scribbling suit consisted of a black woolen pinafore on which she could wipe her pen at will and a cap of the same material, adorned with a cheerful red bow, into which she bundled her hair when the decks were cleared for action. This cap was a beacon to the inquiring eyes of her family, who during these periods kept their distance, merely popping in their heads semi-occasionally to ask with interest, does genius burn, Joe? They did not always venture even to ask this question, but took an observation of the cap and judged accordingly. If this expressive article of dress was drawn low upon the forehead, it was a sign that hard work was going on. In exciting moments, it was pushed rakishly askew, and when despair seized the author, it was plucked wholly off and cast upon the floor. At such times, the intruder silently withdrew, and not until the red bow was seen gaily erect upon the gifted brow did anyone dare address Joe. She did not think herself a genius by any means, but when the writing fit came on, she gave herself up to it with entire abandon and led a blissful life, unconscious of want, care, or bad weather, while she sat safe and happy in an imaginary world, full of friends almost as real and dear to her as any in the flesh. Sleep forsook her eyes, meals stood untasted, day and night were all too short to enjoy the happiness which blessed her only at such times and made these hours worth living, even if they bore no other fruit. The divine afflatus usually lasted a week or two, and then she emerged from her vortex, hungry, sleepy, cross, or despondent. And this final excerpt is from a much later chapter called All Alone. And this is, this is the chapter when Joe has, has learned that, that Lori has um, married Amy. And, and she feels okay about it, but she's a little torn. And so she's, she's now sort of the only unmarried uh, daughter. Um, now, if she had been the heroine of a moral storybook, she ought at this period of her life to have become quite saintly, renounced the world, and gone about doing good in a mortified bonnet with tracks in her pocket. But you see, Joe wasn't a heroine. She was only a struggling human girl. 
like hundreds of others, and she just acted out her nature, being sad, cross, listless, or energetic, as the mood suggested. It's highly virtuous to say we'll be good, but we can't do it all at once, and it takes a long pull, a strong pull, and a pull all together, before some of us even get our feet set in the right way. Jo had got so far, she was learning to do her duty and to feel unhappy if she did not, but to do it cheerfully, ah, that was another thing. She had often said she wanted to do something splendid, no matter how hard, and now she had her wish, for what could be more beautiful than to devote her life to father and mother, trying to make home as happy to them as they had to her? And if difficulties were necessary to increase the splendor of the effort, what could be harder for a restless, ambitious girl than to give up her own hopes, plans, and desires, and cheerfully live for others? Providence had taken her at her word. Here was the task, not what she had expected, but better, because self had no part in it. Now, could she do it? She decided that she would try, and in her first attempt, she found the helps I have suggested. Still another was given her, and she took it not as a reward, but as a comfort, as Christian in, in Pilgrim's Progress took the refreshment afforded by the little arbor where he rested as he climbed the hill called Difficulty. Why don't you write? That always used to make ha you happy, said her mother once, when the desponding fit overshadowed her. I've no heart to write, and if I had, nobody cares for my things. We do. Write something for us, and never mind the rest of the world. Try it, dear. I'm sure it would do you good, and please us very much. Don't believe I can. But Joe got at her desk and began to overhaul her half-finished manuscripts. An hour afterwards, her mother peeped in, and there she was, scratching away with her black pinafore on and an absorbed expression, which caused Mrs. March to smile and slip away, well pleased with the success of her suggestion. Joe never knew how it happened, but something got into that story that went straight to the hearts of those who read it. For when her family had laughed and cried over it, her father sent it, much against her will, to one of the popular magazines. And to her utter surprise, it was not only paid for, but others requested. Letters from several persons whose praise was honor followed the appearance of the little story. Newspapers copied it, and strangers as well as friends admired it. For a small thing, it was a great success, and Joe was more astonished than when her novel was commended and condemned all at once. So um, because of this event, I, I, I found myself reading this, this um, wonderful dual biography uh, of, of Louisa May Alcott and her father called Eden's Outcast by John Madison. Um, Lots of other people liked it. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, but Madison wrote of Louisa that she had become habituated to desire. And I, I think it's a really apt and lovely description of her. Um, desire, after all, is the state of always wanting, but never quite having. Um, it is the state of seeking. And it's, it's a large part of the condition of, of being a writer, um, chasing after that deliciously elusive mystery of, of story. Um, so I'm going to finish with a, a short bit from my own work. Um, and the, the connection may not be so obvious, but in it, uh, there's a bit of that longing um, and restlessness and desire and searching. Uh, and it, it's also, it's a, it's, it's a small self-contained chapter from my novel, Genealogy. And in it, a father reads to his daughter. Um, so that seemed apt, as, as Little Women was first read aloud to me and to, to many of us, I imagine. Um, so the, the chapter has a title, and the title is The, the Name of the Fairy Tale. Uh, and the, the name of the fairy tale is The Story of the Young Boy Who Went Forth to Learn What Fear Was. Storytellers would tell these stories originally as a form of entertainment when the light began to fade, Bernard would say, to the top of Marguerite's tiny head, tucked into the crook of his arm. How could a head be so tiny? Before TV, he would say, in the dark ages, you know, when things were dark. He pulled the words out of the air, <laughs> articulating the forever shifting night, carving out the rhythm of the dark with his voice. It wasn't long before he didn't need the thick book of Grimm's fairy tales, whose binding had cracked because over the years, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old Marguerite was stubbornly determined to hear this particular story, and only this story. Nothing else would do. This story has realness, she said, and Bernard knew what she meant. He had the story memorized, and when he began to tell it, the shapes of the objects in Marguerite's room, the wooden horse in the bureau, her clothes hanging in her closet, the papier-mâché musical note that her brother made for her birthday one year grew starker, 
their outlines more evident. It seemed to Marguerite that the telling of the story invited the night, and everything she thought she knew was suddenly not itself, but something strange and unfamiliar and therefore more beautiful. At first, Bernard worried the story was too scary, but it was a story about longing, and well, longing was scary. Still, Bernard did make some changes that he didn't tell Marguerite about. He made the younger son rebellious and wily as opposed to stupid because Marguerite so fiercely identified with this wandering child, and really, Bernard thought, the story was wrong, the kid was anything but stupid. He was adventurous and eccentric, but not dumb. Read, read, Marguerite would chant. And Bernard would begin. A farmer had a younger son who wasn't afraid of anything, but it wasn't a good thing. The son wanted to know what it was like to shudder the way his older brother did whenever he was in the dark or in a graveyard or any other grim or dismal place. Grim, Marguerite would say with delight, dismal. And it always alarmed Bernard how frighteningly at home these words were in the mouth of his young daughter. When the older brother got old enough, he became a farmer like his father, but the younger brother wasn't sure how he wanted to earn his living. When his father asked him how he expected to survive, the younger son said, before I decide how to make my way in the world, I would like to learn how to shudder. Luckily, a villager agreed to teach the youngest son how to shudder. In the middle of the night, he pretended to be a ghost, but the boy wasn't afraid. In fact, the boy challenged the so-called ghost and threw him down the stairs. In the morning, when the villager's wife asked the boy if he had learned how to be scared, the boy said no, but a ghost had bothered him, and he'd thrown him down the stairs. Eek, Marguerite would exclaim, pretending to be the wife, exclaiming in horror because it made Mar Bernard laugh. With despair, the father sent the boy out into the world because he was no longer welcome in the village. He's in trouble, right, Marguerite would say giddily. And how, Bernard would answer. Hold on, there's more. The boy wandered out into the world and came upon a king and his haunted castle. The king told the boy that if he was able to stay in the haunted castle for three nights without leaving, then the king would allow him to marry his beautiful daughter, the princess. Other men had tried, but none of them succeeded because they were too scared. Well, this was exactly what the boy was looking for, a chance to learn what fear was. So the boy agreed to stay in the haunted castle. The first night, two enormous black cats with fiery red eyes tried to eat the boy, but he fought them off with a hot poker. The second night, the boy's bed moved across the room, and instead of being afraid, the boy said, faster. <laughs> and the third night, a dead man, who had been cut in two, fell down the chimney in two pieces, which sewed themselves together once he landed on his feet, and the half-man turned whole, tried to strangle the boy. But the boy took a hatchet and cut the man in half again, and the two parts of the man skulked out of the castle. At this point, Marguerite would hold her hands like claws, hold up her hands like claws, and wave them around in Bernard's face. OK, enough skulking, Bernard would say. When the king returned and found the boy unscathed, he offered him his daughter's hand in marriage. The boy accepted because the daughter was very beautiful, but still, the boy didn't know what it was to shudder. He didn't know what fear was. After several weeks of listening to her new husband complain, the princess decided to teach him a lesson. She went to a nearby river and filled a bucket with tiny flickering fish. When she returned to the castle, she snuck into her into their dark bedroom and poured the fish down the back of her husb husband's nightshirt. Oh, what makes me shudder so, the young boy turned husband shouted, jumping from the bed. Ah, wife, he said, you have taught me what it is to be afraid, and for that I am forever grateful. Marguerite thought Bernard's fairy tale voice was a little scary, and she worried that it might stay that way forever deep and ghostly. At the same time, she wished that his voice would get stuck and he, he would be forced to read the story over and over again. This boy who wanted nothing more in life than to shudder made her own fear seem important, something that would someday lead her to wisdom and gratitude. It's about how sometimes the smaller things are the scariest, Bernard said the first time he read it, feeling a professorial need to end with an explanation. But it's mysterious too, Marguerite said, and Bernard was proud that his daughter appreciated at such a young age the joy in a story's ability to continue to exist just out of reach. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I think I'm close enough. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today celebrating the life of Louisa May Alcott. Um, she's a really gifted writer and a really a remarkable woman. Um, the books that I chose today for our display, which after I'm done, you'll be welcome to come up and, and take a look at and ask me questions, um, not only came to the library through copyright um, deposits, but also through uh, gifts to the library in larger collections, which I will talk to uh, talk more about later. 
What I wanted to do with my selections was not just focus on her most well-beloved tale, Little Women, but to also note the perhaps lesser known aspects of her literary career um, and interests. So I'm going to go through each one and tell you a little bit about it. The first one, which is up here um, in the front, is um, a book called Flower Fables. It was published in 1855, and um, it was actually dedicated to uh, Ellen Emerson. One interesting thing to note about um, Louisa May Alcott, her extraordinary childhood as a result of her father's influence, um, both good and bad. Um, he was a noted transcendentalist, and he was friends with many noted authors, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, though Bronson Alcott took charge of his four daughters' education, their education was supplemented by teachings from these other authors, and that really impacted Louisa uh, in particular. Thoreau, for example, would take them on berry picking adventures through the woods around Walden Pond. And he would refer to the woods as fairyland. And this really inspired Louisa to think about um, things like elves and fairies and, and nature in a whole new light. And while they were on these expeditions, Louisa would make up these stories. And she would share them with her friends and her sisters and with Thoreau. And Ellen Emerson, who would come with them on these berry picking expeditions, loved the story so much that eventually she did publish the book. This is a first edition of that book. The dedication in there is to Ellen Emerson. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really fabulous book with short stories that focus on the themes of love and kindness and responsibility. And um, the next book I have out here is Hospital Sketches, which was mentioned earlier. Um, while, she, while Louisa was serving in the, uh, in the Civil War as a nurse, she was, uh, as Maud said, down in, um, in Georgetown, D.C., at the Union, Union Hospital. And she wrote these letters back home that when she returned home after the six weeks that she served, were then gathered, reworked, she gave herself a pseudonym, and then they were published. Um, initially, they were published in 1863. The version we have here is published in 1869. Uh, which is when they published it the second time with some additions. So this is kind of an updated version of the original publication. We also have out a book called Moods, which is lesser known. And it was the first novel Louisa ever tried to write. This is a really interesting story for a number of reasons. Um, it dealt with the story of a, of a woman trying to make a life for herself and be self-sufficient and not fitting into society's uh, rules. And what happened was she submitted the story to a number of publishers who then told her it was too long, and she edited and chopped it down and chopped it down. And when it was finally accepted for publication, the story was completely different. It, Louisa was really unhappy with it, and she ended up rewriting and working it over, um, over the next 10, 20 years. Um, and I think she was never really uh, pleased with it again. And John Madison, who Maude had mentioned also, noted, quote, Louisa had begun the novel as a psychological study of her heroine. By the time the editing was finished, the story no longer read like a nuanced meditation on an unbalanced mind, but like a tangled romance. A work of high ambition and extreme candor, moods fell victim to the inexperience of its author and to the overly commercial sensibilities of the editor. So an unfortunate story, but we have it here for you to look at um, in its published form. Um, unfortunately, she was unhappy with it, but that's how it goes. Um, I do have a copy of Little Women out for display. It's a first edition. Um, it's illustrated by her younger sister, May Alcott, who uh, the character Amy was based off of in Little Women. And um, it's, as you know, it was published in 1868. It was, uh, she didn't want to write the story. It was uh, her publisher at the time, Thomas Niles, had asked her to publish a girl's story, which she refused to do for a long time. And then her father was talking to the publisher, and uh, the publisher agreed to publish something of his if he got her to write this story. <laughs> so she sat down and in two and a half months wrote Little Women. And um, she thought it was dull. She didn't really love it. She gave it to her publisher. He also thought it was dull. <laughs> he gave it to his niece. She read it and loved it. 
who gave it to a friend of hers who read it and loved it. And so they said, well, you know, I, these girls like it, let's go with it. And it sold, it was an immediate success. It sold 2,000 copies, first printing. And then um, people demanded second parts and more additions, and it ended up being this, you know, this whole set of works. Um, so the, another book that I have here is Little Men, which was published a couple years later. It was 19, 1871, and um, it was a follow-up story. The reason I pulled this out is because we have two really interesting copies of this book at the library. The one I have out here was the first book to be a part of a much larger collection that was given to the library in 1936. The collector's name was John D. Batchelder, and he had a collection of about 1,500 works of significant Western uh, literary works. And um, so in his whole collection, he had this book, and in the book is a little piece of paper that says this book was purchased and published the year of John Batchelder's birth. So it was the start of his collection, the start of his life, and I thought it was a really fantastic um, part of, it's, if his collection was of significant American Western literature and this was in it, I mean, it's just a really great start for his collection. Um, the other copy of Little Men that we have uh, that's really special is in our Russian Imperial collection. And that is actually inscribed by the emperor and empress to their daughter. Um, so I thought that was really interesting because it shows how far reaching the impact of Louisa May Alcott's work was and is. And so I don't have that one out, but it's here, so you can always come back and ask for it, and we will be glad to show it to you. Um, another thing that I thought was interesting when I started doing research about Louisa was she often wrote under pseudonyms. Um, she had one name, A.M. Bernard, which she wrote more lurid Gothic tales, which she preferred to write, actually. Um, and we have one book, uh, the blue one in the front is called The Mysterious Key and What It Opened. It's a dime novel that was published originally under the pseudonym A.M. Bernard, and it wasn't discovered that these un unknown works were hers until the 1970s, 1980s, which really opened up a whole new vein of critical um, interest in her work uh, in more modern times. We're taking a whole new look at things. Um, so that was a really interesting story. And then we have in the No Name series, um, a title, The Modern Mephistopheles, which is her retelling of the Faust tale. It's really, it's really fantastic, and I highly recommend reading it. Um, and it's, it was published anonymously, and um, as I said, it was only discovered later that these works should be attributed to her, which adds a whole new dimension to her character. And we know her as writing these quaint stories about responsibility and morality, and, and here she is writing these like really gruesome, passionate, fiery novels that we, you know, we usually don't attribute to her. Um, the final item that I have on the table, the book is Jack and Jill, which was one of her later stories. It was published in 1880, eight years before she passed away. And though it's, the book itself is not a copy that's magnificent or, it, I mean, it's a lovely copy, but what I found inside were four manuscript leaves in her handwriting of the story. So I recommend you come up and take a look at everything. Um, and so I, I would be happy to show and turn pages for everyone and come up and see the display. <laughs>